thank you. So first of all, because I'm, um, as you said, Henrietta, we are called a, an Italian office in Germany, but I'm not Italian, I'm Argentinian. So if you check on my office, our office from today, just try to tell all the others that's an Argentinian office. So I can have some, you know, share of the whatever we do because they don't register that I'm Argentinian because the Italians, they have so much style and flair, so they don't care about it. But actually I'm Argentinian. I met my partners in Venice too many years ago. And then we came together to, to Germany because there was no possibility to become an architect in Italy or in Argentina in any case. So that's why we start working in, in Germany and to to, <clears throat> to, take, to, to keep the, the Germans uh, quiet, we always, I always tell them, okay, we are not German architects, but we, are, we learned our profession in Germany, and that's really true. So that's the real truth. And my name is Pepe Marquez because actually my real name is Jose Mario Gutierrez Marquez Arias Trujillo Suarez Toledo, and I thought <laughs> that Henrietta wouldn't be able to pronounce that. And the Germans, in any case, they never managed. So from Jose Mario Gutierrez Marquez Arias Trujillo Suarez Toledo, we got to Pepe, that is all the Jose's are Pepe's in South America. And at the end of it, Marquez is the other one that they can pronounce very well, the Germans. Marquez is easy for them. So I'm Pepe Marquez, very easy to do. So, and um, today I, I didn't know what, what kind of work I should tell you because we are always afraid that you're going to get bored or you're going to not pay attention and start looking at your phones. And we are, we are terrified with the old generations when you start looking at your phones. So I'm going to switch under the main title that would be um, constraints. So when architects are constrained, uh, they, are, they have a lot of difficulties doing their work because they're build, they are making a project in, with an existing building that would be what you were referring to in buildings that exist, exist already is another kind of behavior uh, compared to places where there's no existing building and you have to make a new one. So we can follow, or we are going to, I'm going to tell you, uh, follow from a free project, so with an empty lot, and how we behave and why do we behave as we do in an empty lot, and then we switch to a very strong, very other condition where we are really chained and completely full of obstacles because we are planning inside or having to take into the project an existing building. So you can switch from freedom, but it's not freedom, of course, to being in chains. So then I'm going to take up, depending on how many switch to their phones, we can talk about two projects or maybe four. I'm going to be fast and worry because I saw that somebody look at my power presentation and said, oh, there are so many pages, but uh, we Argentinians, <laughs> We are very, very fast. So the first one is a free project, meaning it's a new project in Swiss. And the second one is going to be these master houses in, in Dessau. So you can compare the different uh, results depending on the starting situation. So this is, this is Lugano, and this is the, the place where we are, Lugano is a, is a city of the 19th century around a beautiful lake that is called Lugano Lake. And it's a kind of a very simple structure, but during the, the centuries, not many centuries, only two centuries, uh, it develops in a very chaotic way. And then when we look for the place that we, this is a competition, all the, all the projects are competitions. So we only survive through winning competitions. So you don't know if you're going to find us in the next 10 years when we don't win any competition at all and take some photographs because we are not going to be there anymore. So uh, this is the place, the area, and they were looking for a new kindergarten. That's the only German word for that, I would say. Also in Argentina's kindergarten, uh, a garden for, for the children. And uh, we take a look at, uh, at the area because we were trying to start a conversation, you know, metaphorically because you are supposed to start a conversation if you're building something new. You are not alone playing your cello. You are in an orchestra who's already playing and with a very, very colorful uh, texture of different sounds. So you try to find your place in your orchestra and try to play with your orchestra. Somebody, somebody tries, somebody wants to play solo. So we, we don't play solo. We try to play with the orchestra, but the orchestra was not playing very well. So the orchestra was not playing at all because if you see 
just the, oh, the, the, the quality of the context around us. You have very big uh, fabric, also factories, and you have small villages, and you have buildings in between. So we tried to start a conversation, and we couldn't. So, well, there's no way we are going to be able to inter, uh, interact with a context, and this is a kindergarten. So we're supposed to have a kindergarten works with closed spaces and open spaces. You play inside, you play outside. But playing outside on this area was not going to be fun. This is the area. So as, as you may know, this, this is this nothing, this is not the kind of the 19th century architecture consistent when you would say, well, we can, we can refer to this uh, context, but there was a kind of fragmentarity all over the place. And having to have the children half of the time outside playing, we say, well, there's no way we're going to, to relate to this context for the playing grounds of the children. So we said, well, we will have to talk with ourselves. So we are going to try to start a conversation with ourselves and provide for open spaces that were not around the building, but they were in the building. So, and that was one of the, so we always talk about a conceptual script in the, our office, so we have to discuss in the office what are we going to do and try to formalize conceptually what we want to do. One is, for example, conceptually, we, okay, we have to talk with ourselves. We're not having a conversation with a context in an architectural way. That was one conceptual point. The other one is, is the kindergarten is always depending on the size. You have uh, four rooms. In Swiss is more or less more or less all the same. You have a kind of different rooms where the kids do different things. And then depending how big is the kindergarten, you have from these four rooms, five rooms, you have one, two, three, four, five, depending how big the, the kindergarten is. So you say, okay, this is a group of uh, five units, six units, and each unit are five rooms. So normally, if you're designing a kindergarten, you just start with a cluster of rooms, and then you just multiply them and put them together in some way. Some way you put all the rooms together, and I suppose these units are exactly the same, because there's no reason to make them different. And we say on conceptual discussion, this is not good or could be done better. We could try to give the children a room that they could identify, not only a room inside a building, but a room outside a building. And we were trying to offer a kind of diversity and the quality of the rooms. But at the same time, we were expected to do a repetition because all the kindergartens are a repetition of this, these five rooms as many times as necessary. So this is a model of the project, but actually I will go faster. This is one reference of architecture for kindergarten. This is Sharoon. You heard of him. You're finishing the career. If you don't, you should. Uh, and this guy was playing with a different kind of geometries, and we knew him very well. I was telling Herrieta that uh, good architects. So I, saw, I start always the, 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 the other way around. Uh, bad architects, they just copy things. So you could copy him, and you would do depending on how good are you copying something very good, just copying him. Or you can be smarter if you are, and you can steal from him. That means that you, it's not the same to copy and to steal. To steal is to understand the conceptual script of the great heads that we are not, and then, then understanding the conceptual structure of this kind of thing, you can do something completely different, but actually it's the same because it has stolen and not copied. So you don't get it, but actually we are stealing from him. So we were stealing from him. And then we said, well, how can we get to offer? First, we have to have the conversation between the open and the closed spaces, not talking with the context. And then we want to have a diversity so the kids can relate to their own uh, set of rooms. So you have to, and at the same time, you have to be very economic and, and not also repeat things, if things are going to be re uh, repeated, you have to repeat it to save money. You, don't, you can't have five rooms in one way and another way, and another way is going to cost too much money if you had not repetition. So, that, so they were expecting from us a very repetitious kindergarten concept because that's the way you do. So we tried to, what we did, we took the lot, then we put a grid on the lot, and then we divide the grid uh, depending on the sum of the cover spaces and the open spaces. So this is all the spaces we had to put in the lot. So we made our grid, 
and then we start to work with a grid trying to generate uh, diversity. So this is a stupid grid actually because it's a, it's a square grid but if you can you don't see it because it's very thin but here this, the, 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 the squares are going all the way like in chess but you can move from one other point, point from the square here and here and then what you're doing is, is the same but it's not the same and it's not the same being the same keep with me <laughs> so it's, if you put two squares together they're like this room I could divide this room and if I put them together I would have a, another square so a rectangle and if I put three squares together, I would have a longer rectangle. And uh, you would never notice how many squares are, are making a rectangle. If you put this together, you always notice how many of them there are because the, the walls are folding and telling you how many of them there are. So even if it's the same thing, the same thing, actually this kind of grid is having a rhythm and you always get the tact. This is the way the building is breathing. If you're going with square, you just and you stay and do the next one. So if you follow it, then this is our at the end that was the three-dimensional module or block with a trapeze on the ground floor plus four different heights. Not even any of the heights is the same. That means that this room is not like this, but it's like this. It's a, in Argentina, we call it a hyperbolic paraboloid. I don't know how you call it in Slovakia. Uh, but it's a, it's a torch, it's a torqued surface. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, you're not very original. So I thought, well, okay. yeah. Oh, inferiority complex, I see. We have it too in Argentina. You know, we don't think we are good enough, but uh, forget about it. So we have these models and each group of rooms are five of them. So one, two, three, four, five. This is one, two, three, four, five. And this would be one group. We had, I think, five groups in the kindergarten. So you know already what we are doing, I think. No? You can follow it here. This is the corner. These are five. These are the five. This is the sanitary rooms and the wardrobe. This is a move, also exercise room. This is where they uh, eat, of course, and this is where they play quietly. In Argentina, we don't have that room. So, uh, so this is another, of course, uh, these are another five combined in a different way, but just, but just exactly the same, not being the same. You, you understood already. So we can combine them in different ways. So we're going to combine the same model. So it's a high repetitious grade. It's very economic to do. But at the same time, every time, we don't repeat ourselves. This is another group. You can check it where the group is uh, on the grid. So we can go backwards, forwards. That's the next one. They don't repeat themselves, but are the same. So I keep saying it because it sounds very well. It's not the same, but it's the same. So. And at the end, of course, what it remains are the open spaces. So we, because we count all the surfaces at the beginning, so the grid is the sum of closed and not closed. So what you got here is at the end, uh, but it's a very funny story at the end. These are the rooms. I'm going again back. You can lo locate the five rooms cluster inside the grid. This is the model. Um, look what happened here. That is reality. At the end of the project, the users came to us and said, oh, we forgot a couple of rooms. So after all this work, there was, of course, no place at all to put one single room. So we just put our air pump. And something happened that is completely, you shouldn't do this because you are killing your own concept. Uh, we just managed to put these four rooms on top of the other ones. Of course, these are not rational and, uh, rooms that we can repeat, but uh, there was no way backwards. We would have uh, done everything again. It was impossible to do. They, they just accepted, and we lost some rationality of the concept on the corner. But of course, if you forget about rationality, it's a beautiful effect of contradiction between rationality and chance. 
So this is all the work you are doing in the, here, supposed to in models all the time to try to understand better what you're doing. So we do the same in the office, and I think every architect is going to confirm that models you can do without them. If you think you can, you're not going as good architecture as you could do if you do models. So I hope I'm helping some professor, but you are at the end of it, so whatever. So this is also photographs of the model. This is just checking, we, we were checking before we, we, we build it. So you can see this in this, in this concept, there are, these are the open spaces. You see them because there's some graphic of trees and water, uh, fountains. And this is actually the central corridor. There are no corridors because there are no spaces that are specialized. So we get here through a portico. This is an entrance court and then you get inside you go all the way along here, you can feel the rhythm of the building you know, when you're walking along the corridor, and then you can access all the different groups, clusters. Sections, this is the, the upper floor, so the chance. I'm just going very fast because this is not interesting because we build it. So these are all, of course, the rationality of the construction is in wood. Everything is good as made in wood and it was built very fast because we don't, you don't have water on the construction site and you don't have to wait for anything. You just put it together. There are the different levels of constructions. This is, uh, this is the load bearing walls. These are the load bearing beams with all already the positions for the other beams. This is all computer generated. They just cut the things with a, with a uh, I don't know how you say it in English, uh, machine that cuts the, the, the wood as it would be paper from the top. So you can give them anything you want. There's no problem at all. Before it would be a nightmare for somebody trying to do these three-dimensional things, but today they have a machine and they do it without. You try to impress them with the complexity of the project and say, yes, well, we do it. It's, it's very, very disturbing. So this is just the system of when you're constructing wood, but we, I like this effect. It's really exactly what you do. So what you have in a computer is what they do because they do with your document in computer. So there's no, there's no uh, difference between. These are the hyperbolic paraboloids or parabolic hyperboles. I'm not sure what's the real, it's the same. So they, they give you, if you cut them, they give you a parabole and in the other direction, they give you an hyperbole. So. These are the construction site. We are almost finished here. So this, I don't have to say anything else. This is the, the project at the end. Of course, this project is talking with itself. It's not talking with the environment around it. It sounds horrible, but the, uh, the environment was horrible. So, and of course, it's generating his own open spaces. So when the kids are coming out to make a break or uh, play outside, they are playing inside their own building. So that is, and the traffic and all the noise around was unbearable. And there's always some light coming through the, window, the, the roof from different situations. As I said, this, everything is in wood. These are the open spaces. That's what I'm saying. We are talking with ourselves. All the open spaces doesn't, are not aware of the context around them. The trees are growing slowly. And the, the, the wood is supposed to be gray in 10 years, maybe a, a normal gray. That's why it's white and uh, and black because the colors are not, we don't like them. So we're just waiting for 10 years and then, uh, then, then we're going to, to color, Technicolor, not yet. So these are water, they are playing with water and making a mess of it. And this is, this is the architecture that you get. So it's, of course, there's a complexity that, I could say that we were in control of all the complexity that we were generating with the grid and the combinations, but we are not. So we discover the places. Once you have a critical mass of complexity interactions, then there's a surplus of situations that you are not aware of at all. And you visit your own buildings and start to, uh, to discover situations and sequences that you were not aware of if the complexity is, is high enough.
this is the place who goes higher. <laughs> so on, behind that wall, this is the upper floor. And we are photographing this one. This is the one who's not following the rules. So we don't, we don't do kindergartens with too much color because they come with so much color because everybody thinks that the kids, they, they need color. So they have color clothes for the kids, color toys for the kids and everything is, is so much color that we said, let's take quiet because the color is going to come in any case. So we just decided to have a, a very, very soft light. And uh, so this is white and black, but everything is almost white. So, so this is one. I hope you got it. It's going to be that fast. The, the, the next one is a bit more complex, but the next one is in a pre-existing building. So this is a complete another game, and you will notice how the approach is completely different. This is another competition. This is a closed competition. There were only six offices, uh, and this is completely, completely different. I'm going to tell, I have to tell you the story of the buildings, otherwise you're not able to understand what, what was happening. Uh, I hope you have heard of the uh, rationalist movements from the Germans in the 20s. And one of these guys was Walter Gropius. He was a very smart guy. And um, he was teaching in front of my chair, not that I'm on the same level than him, but he was teaching in Weimar. Uh, and he started with all the Bauhaus uh, theory of teaching architecture and the relationship between architects, artists, and uh, artisans. He was saying, and the Bauhaus was saying, that the artisans, they have a knowledge, a knowledge between their hands and their head, and the, the artists, they have another knowledge. And we architects, we can learn from them a lot. So if we put them all together teaching, then we are going to get better architects than otherwise. So he wasn't being able to teach as he wanted in Weimar, and the city was making trouble with him. He, the city changed the the dominant party was from a socialist party to a centrist right party on the 20s, and they started to identify him with leftists, and they cut the money, and it was making his life horrible. So he said, well, who wants a great architecture and um, school in Germany? He said, who wants to have us the Bauhaus? And so some city was named Dessau. Dessau would have been the Silicon Valley. So in Dessau was an industry of aluminum getting started with, uh, uh, under the guy who was not uh, uh, our, our Steve Jobs, but his name was uh, Junker. You've heard Junker, these heating devices, Junker. Well, he was making heating devices and all kinds of things in aluminum. He was a rich guy, a smart guy, who said, I give you money if you take the school to Dessau. And Gropius said, I come to Dessau if you pay to for a building of the school, and not only that, because I'm not going to have many good professors just inviting them to a very small city, also this hour. So I need to lure them with some other kind of offer. So he said, I need to build them houses so they can still work in their things, artists and whatever they are, and they can teach in this hour. Only in, only in this way, maybe I had the chance to get very good people. So I come to this hour, you pay for my school, and uh, you pay for the houses for the professors. And this guy and the, the socialists were in Dessau in those days, and they said, well, we put some money, you put the other money. And they, he came to Dessau, and uh, he said, oh, by the way, I'm the architect who's going to do the projects. I forgot to say that. Uh, and he did the projects. So we are talking about here, about the houses that he designed for the professors of the house, of the this, uh, Bauhaus, and for the director of the Bauhaus that was him. So he made somebody, a guy, pay for his house as director of his school, and, and he made the project. So learn from these guys. So these are, this is the, the plan of the three double houses, and the director house. Here is a piece missing. It's the garage. It's the only house with the garage. It's the director house. That, by the way, as I said before, is his house. So don't forget hierarchy. We should try to forget hierarchy, but they weren't forgetting hierarchy on those days. So these are three double houses, Doppelhäuser. So there was two artists or teachers living in each of these houses. The houses were exactly the same, and this was 
of course, different. And around it, they made a wall because they want to take sun on the wild because they were so uh, avant-garde that uh, they didn't want to be uh, spy on. So they make a wall outside. And many years afterwards with uh, Mies van der Rohe, this other guy that you should know about, uh, was director of the school. He didn't, couldn't help himself to leave his marks as all male of the species too. So he did a small, small box on the corner of the wall. Um, that's called the Trinkhalle in German, the drinking hall. And when I was told this is a, this is a building from Mies, I thought a huge building with a thousand Germans, they get together to drink. No, it's this very small kiosk where you sell something to drink, but it's usually a very small, it's a very small box in, somewhere in the city. So these are the houses. This is a story. I tell you a story because otherwise you can understand what we did have to solve because it was a very difficult problem to solve. So these are the photographs of uh, one of the wives of one of the teachers, uh, Laszlo Moholy Notch. Maybe you heard of him. And it was Lucia Moholy who was as smart as him, but he, she was a woman, so not, not so well known as. Last law itself, and these are the, the 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 ground floors of the of the houses. This is the ground floor with a living room. So of course, uh, for Walter Gropius, this chance was a win, 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 win chance. So I'm going to do my school. I'm going to do, do my house. I'm going to design the houses of my professors with my own office, and I'm going to tell the world how architects should do architecture in the future. So this is my manifest too everything with one single operation. So these houses were telling the world, this is the way houses should be. This is the way architects should do houses. Houses are, um, are objects that help us to live better. So they are supposed to function, uh, making life easier and more enjoyable. They are, as a French architect said, a machine, as a machine to help you to live better. So a machine to to dwell in English, and he, that's what he was doing. So he's saying, don't worry about anything. Tell me what you need. I'm going to design the perfect house for you. So all these houses were designed under this kind of premise that the house was answering to the function. And you know this paradigm that forms should follow function. That, is, that was said by a guy in Chicago named Louis Sullivan. You should take a look at him another smart guy. And he said, of course, architecture is the result of we architects trying to provide the needs of the function. And it was a great slogan, and that's why they were called functionalists. They say that and they, de they claim that, but it's not true. That that's not what they were doing. That was only the slogan. But they were claiming that all the architecture was the result of a very, very pragmatic analysis of the needs of the client. And the function would, the form would follow the function if we interrogate the function uh, deep enough. So, so these are the house. This is the director house. So his house, this is the house, and this is his garage. And of course, this was at the day avant-garde architecture. Beautiful architecture. So I, 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 that's my opinion. And a very good architecture too. The spaces were are because they are still there. And this was his house, this was his terrace, and he has a problem with the construction. He would have liked this uh, prisma to cantilever over his terrace, but with the technology of today, he couldn't do it, it was too expensive. But as architects sometimes do, they still try to make the cake and eat it. So he put some glasses here and he put some black, black glass around his column so you don't see the column. Of course, you see the column, but if you see some photographs, uh, you notice that uh, this is the interior, but I don't have the photographs maybe before, no. Oh. Uh, no, I don't have them, but we will see. This is the house inside his house. This is the house that was a project to make you or make your life much more enjoyable. For example, this is he, uh, his wife, that's him looking happy. Uh, 
Yeah, this is, uh, this is all publicity. This is, of course, nobody came and said, oh, I, may I take your photograph? No, there was a photograph making all these kind of pictures that were going to the world. For example, you can see here water, uh, I don't know how you call them. And he was saying, of course, we, we like to drink our tea on the living room and we don't want to go to the kitchen. So we're going to make a tea set and a heater here so we can make the tea just sitting on the sofa. And there was all kind of gadgets all around the house telling you that this new architecture would be a better architecture. This is, uh, for example, of course, it's architecture with hierarchy, people working for him, women working for men, etc. Forget about it, I didn't say that, but uh, uh, this is the architecture they did. They did it very fast on the 20s, so from, uh, so 19, I think it was 1921 to 1923, they finished all the houses and the director house. So that's the story. This is, uh, that's Mies van der Rohe marking his territory on the wall. This is the Trinkhalle, a German definition, very imprecise. And this is what happened immediately afterwards, 33, the National Socialists take over the power in Germany and all the administrations and the local cities, they change from the original party to a Nazi party. And of course they identified immediately, this is not the architecture that we want to represent Germany in the world. So immediately the, the Bauhaus was attacked and then they moved to Berlin because they couldn't work in Dessau anymore. And they were telling, I don't know if you can read German, uh, they were telling that these houses should be disappear from the, from the city of Dessau because they were corrupted architecture. You know the story. So it was happening, of course, to the rationalism architecture, architecture also. And immediately after, so not immediately, but six years afterwards, the war started. The Nazis took over the industry of Mr. Juncker, who was making just heating and boilers. And with the aluminum technology, they started to make um, airplanes. And maybe you have heard of the Junkers airplanes of the Second World War, maybe the guys. They were very good uh, and very light uh, airplanes because they were made in aluminum, the technique that he has developed making boilers, but the Nazis just say, you sell it to us, thank you very much. And he sold the, the industry to them and they start to make it airplanes. Of course, because they were making airplanes during the war, the, the city was bombarded many times to destroy the industry of aviation in Dessau. And of course, the bombers were not as, pre as precise as they would claim they were. And uh, as you see, this is one of the double houses of the artists the atelier window and a bomb fell between the director house and the first double house during the war. That was 44, I think, I'm not sure. This is what was left. And this is what was left from the director house, only the basement. On some just pieces of the basement, the, all the house on top of it was destroyed by the bomb that fell in between. So that was on the 44, then came the, the Socialist Republic and they decide that these houses should be houses for the people and not for artists. And so they didn't reconstruct it or try to rebuild them as they used to be because they didn't appreciate the architecture either. So the rationalism had a very bad luck. He was, um, uh, he was diminished by the right and diminished by the left. That they were make, finding their place in any kind of regime in Germany on those days. So this is the way we found it, the socialist uh, Republic of Germany built a traditional house on top of the basement. The garage was luckier, he survived the bombing. So this is what we found on the 90s, at the end of the 90s. And during the 90s, after the reunion of the two Germanies, this is what they found after the reunion. And this is what it used to be. So this is uh, the 26, and this is what happened during those years after. These were houses for the people, for working people. This was the situation, 91, 92, maybe the photograph. These are the original models. That is what happened between these years. And this is what we found when we started a competition. 
This is what they did with existing buildings. So they say, and this is where we start the debate. What do you do with something you lost? You lost or, or you transformed so much that you can recognize the original value. So there are, in this case of the master houses, were two things. One were the houses that were still there, that survived, not me, that survived the war but were changed during the, the, the German Socialist Republic. And the other thing was what we do with the houses that we lost. They lost half of one of the artist houses and the director house on top. So one half was missing, and if you want to, also one half was missing from two houses. So that's the question. They ask us and another five offices, tell us what you would do with this problem. Should we reconstruct? That's an euphemism, because I said to them, this is not reconstruction, this is making a copy. So should we make a copy of the past that we lost because it has value? And the consequence of making a copy is that uh, the new generations, they're not going to know that it's a copy, if it's a good copy. And maybe they will forget that we actually lost these buildings because there was a war. So um, the debate was, should we get back what we lost because it has value? Or should we witness what happened with history? So we lost these valuable things. And maybe that's the thing that we should keep reminding us to not, not to lose some other things that we, that we value. So the debate was between two fractions. One said, let's get everything back as it used to be. We don't care, it's a copy. It's beautiful, it's necessary, we have to do it. And the other fraction said, no, we are chronicles of history. We can bring the past back. We have to do something new because that's what happened and we can go back to the past, we can look to the past. So that was the debate that we came into with a, with a project. And there was another, so the, the discussion in the office was, this is a minefield, there are two fractions, they're going to kill us in any case. So there's no way we can have a project that could satisfy both, or maybe there is. So this is what we do in the office, but I think in every office, you discuss the concept before, because otherwise you can't start to do anything. So in the, in the kindergarten, we were discussing uh, do we have a context to relate to? Do we have a repetition of the spaces or we can have some kind of diversity? Are we having a conversation with ourselves or with others? In this case, the, the thesis is how we can do something that is not editing the past and still bringing back what was lost that we valued so much. So, this is what we did, that they did, other offices did with the existing houses. They just went back and they rebuilt all the missing pieces exactly as they were. With some differences because of the regulations, you know, the Germans, they never stopped to do regulations. So they had to adapt to the new regulations. So they were slightly different if you know where to look. And this is nice and this is the way if you go there today, so you're going to see the houses that they used to be. You're going to see the ateliers, the concept of the colors, of the materials. It's a real experience of the architecture of those days. But what we do here, so what, what we do with a missing house, of course they did something with a missing house, what we do with a missing half. This column is not original, it's there because otherwise this part of the house would fall down. So we start the discussion in the office, okay, the question is, how can we recover what was lost and still be witness of what happened? So a good metaphor, we work a lot with metaphors in the office, and this is a very good one, because the debate was at the beginning between the fraction that said, let's do it exactly as it was, and the other one, let's do something new. And um, this is the same case if you find a very old vase or fragments of the vase. Because the other dimension is, and that was, that was difficult, is the architectural dimension. So we're not talking about a house that's missing, we're talking about an ensemble. There were three houses and the director house, and the ensemble was the entire thing, not just one single house. So the vase, the fragments, the original fragments, and you can notice which are the original fragments immediately. These are the original fragments, these are not. So, the guys who found the vase didn't find all the pieces. 
And they said, well, but we want to recover the shape of the vase. Maybe there was a fraction, but you can't because you don't have all the pieces. And if you put the pieces that are missing, you are making a copy. And we are going to forget that we destroyed the base or that the base was broken. It's the same thing in architecture, of course. So the solution was, okay, we are going to replace the pieces that are missing, but we are going to do them in a way that anybody could understand that these are not the original surfaces. But doing this, we can, you can, I can see the form of the vase. Beautiful vase. I'm an expert in vases. This is a beautiful vase. One of the most beautiful vases that you've ever seen. You don't know about it, but... Uh, Believe me. So, of course, doing this, we are doing the, the guys who did this tell, tell us the vase was broken. These are the original pieces. These are not, but of course, you understand that these pieces as, are helping you to see the vase again. So, in, in this, I was the same question could we replace the missing pieces, not reconstructing them, but allowing us to see the ensemble again. So this is another case of reconstruction, and this is even more interesting. This is uh, Franz Marc, this uh, expressionist uh, painter, uh, German painter. He made this beautiful picture of the consequences of the war. You don't see it, but this is uh, the, sh the, the destiny of the beasts, the uh, Schicksal, uh, uh, Tieren Schicksal, or the Schicksal Tieren. So, what happened with the beast, the innocence, when the war starts? And the, the saying uh, behind the, the picture, Mark, Mark was saying, uh, when the war started and nature is destroyed, the, the trees show us the rings, and the beasts, they show us their blood, because the, the, the war is terrible on nature. So and this is the painting, but the painting got damaged during the war. And Mark died very, very young. That was the first war. And his friend, Paul Klee, said, well, this is something missing here from the original. And we can appreciate the original picture. So we have to repair and replace the missing part, exactly as what happened here. But here, the, the ones who replaced, they said, this has no artistic value at all. We don't pretend even to do something on the level of the original painting. So we are just there to complete the form so you can appreciate it. But uh, Claire said, well, I can do that. This is a picture. I can uh, reconstruct the picture not doing something that is going to be seen also as a painting. There's not like, okay, let's make a, a line around it and you will notice this part is missing. He said, no, I'm going to interpret it, I'm going to do a repairment, but still you're going to understand that this is not the original, but you can even assign value to the replacing piece. And this is what we decide to do. We decide, okay, you're, we're going to do something new that will allow everybody to understand how the original ensemble was, but you are not going to forget ever that there was a war and we lost these two pieces. So we told them that the answer to this dilemma was uh, to, we were convincing the jury because we had to introduce our concept to the jury. There were uh, many guys, the Chipperfield was there as the big, the big head and we were to convince him somehow. So because if he said you're okay, then we would win the competition. So we talk about the nature of uh, memory and memory being unprecise because you don't remember exactly what, how things happen. So we were opening conceptually the heads and the minds of the jury to introduce our, our idea. And we were saying, we don't remember exactly uh, how things happen. If you talk with your friends of the primary school, they're going to remember the curve of the school is different and the color of the dress of the professor is different. You're going to find out, checking your memories with them, that they are not the same. And who knows what the truth is? So memory is not exact at all. On the contrary, we need to forget things because if we would uh, remember everything, we wouldn't be able to get new knowledge. So the nature of memory is to be, in, is to be imprecise. That was what we told the jury. And there's a guy, this artist. So if you quote artist uh, outside the architectural discipline, of course, your legitimation of arguments is much stronger if you quote other architects. 
because they say, oh, well, these are guys are playing the same game. No, this guy are playing another game. He's an artist and photograph who was, I suppose you know this house. If you don't, take the names and you are not going to finish this year. <laughs> you have to go back. I don't know who's responsible, but somebody is. So this is a very well-known house. And he was making on purpose, as you notice, uh, very, very unsharp, unsharp in English, so out of focus, pictures of very well-known buildings. And even now, when you look at this, you don't get a precise picture of the house. But all of us are in the position to say, well, yeah, we know which house is this one. So, for example, I hope you know this one too. And if you don't, okay, we talk about it. Uh, he was telling us, this guy, Hiroshi Sujimoto, that you are always, depending on how much information you have, you are always able to recognize, to evoke a memory, even if you don't have all the information. Not at all. This is, this is of course, a very, very uh, out-of-focus picture. You, would, you could say this is a very imprecise recollection. So we shouldn't be able to uh, recognize what kind of building it is, but we are. This is what we were told in... Uh, Mr. Chipperfield and the other jury. So we said, how can we translate this in architecture? How, how, what kind of abstract or unprecise architecture do we architects do that everybody can recognize? So do you recognize this house? The columns? This is the director house of... Um, but is this a real house? No, it's not. This is a model. A model is an abstraction that we architects uh, use to understand our own ideas, to not having to make any details. So it's an abstraction of a real thing. And still we could recognize and still we use it to think our projects. So we were telling the jury what we can do, because memory is imperfect, is this is all the conceptual debate before I tell you what we did actually with the architecture. But without the conceptual approach, you don't know what to do. So you need still the conceptual approach that's going to be discussed in the office for many days till you get through that and say, well, this is the roadmap. Now we know what we can do. Let's see if we can do it. So the discussion and the, what we were telling the jury is, let's make an abstract architecture instead of the pieces that we lost. And because it's abstract, you're going to immediately recognize this is not the original piece, but this is still related to the original piece, I can see it, to be able to enjoy all the ensemble on its more or less original situation, like the base and like the picture of uh, Paul Klee. But like Paul Klee, the pieces that we were adding, they had architectural value on itself. Not only being there to get the shape of the base, but being there doing their own statement. So if you do that, that's what we did. <laughs> or if you don't do that, if you just copy, then you lose a chance to make contemporary architecture. You edit history because we lost these houses. And then if somebody who doesn't know the history of architecture comes to say, oh, this, are the, this is the house of Mr. Gropius, smart guy. And uh, <coughs> second thing. And of course, uh, the third thing that if we don't do this is uh, yeah, we lose the chance to tell the future how we do architecture, our generation. If we copy the past, we are gone. We don't exist. We don't leave traces. So we decide and tell the jury that we want to do an abstract architecture to replace the missing spaces, spaces because we don't need to make a perfect one because memory is imperfect and because we need a new statement and we don't want to forget that we lost the houses. So all that together. So we start that. This was our model. This was an abstraction of the original house, very easy to do in the model. It was painted wood, and this was uh, plexiglass. This was the first approach. We're going to do the house in the exact form as it used to be, and we're making, making translucent openings in the exact position and size of the original windows, but nothing else. This is still very easy to say. This is the house, and this was our model. Of course, if we have a second chance, we do without the invisible, invisible columns. I think that Gropius would thank us because he couldn't, but 
now we can. So we did this model, we show it to the jury and said this is what we want to do. We won the competition and then we start the second round inside the office with a contract already, how we do this. So the first thing was to make a cast. A cast, you know where the cast is? So like in the vase, we need the form of the missing piece to put it on the missing place. And we, do it, uh, we did it with a, because it was a cast, we did it with uh, uh, insulating concrete. This is Dembeton. Insulated concrete is a concrete that is such a low density, it floats in water, if you want, that it's insulated at the same time that it can uh, take load. So it's a single element and it takes the form of the missing space and we just put it instead. This was the first uh, operation was to make a cast of the missing spaces and uh, the missing houses and put it instead. And then the interior that we lost too, these were houses and we need to make uh, um, exposition houses. So it was uh, not more for uh, artists who were living there, but a small, uh, um, how do you say, um, for uh, resident artists who would make in here their own work and exhibit the work inside these houses where nobody was living there, so they need another kind of spaces. So we just took away first the cast, and then we look all the original divisions of the housing of the artists, and we took away some pieces. We tell the jury, this is a, you know, in archaeology, you find some bones and you're trying to reconstruct all the skeleton. This time we knew exactly how the skeleton was and we were just throwing bones through the window. So, to make room for new functions. So we took away some things till we were left with an artifact. The definition of an artifact is the pieces of the vase. An artifact is in, in archaeology what you find under the earth and some pieces are missing and you have to put it together. So we call it the artifact, the cast, in insulating concrete and the artifact inside. This is the artifact. Actually, this is a, a new architecture that comes from taking away pieces of an architecture from some other guy. So you are sculpting the architecture of uh, Walter Gropius, taking away from his architecture. This is the cast following the original forms, following the original position and size of the windows and the artifact inside that follows the lines of original walls and, and, and slabs, but not entirely. So somebody who knows the building would be able to, oh, this is, oh, this is, the, this is the floor, this is the other floor, but it's completely communicating. This is the insulated beton, this is uh, concrete, and this is uh, the, we're in Germany. So we were telling, we need a firm that uh, show us that they can do this kind of concrete that we need. And we make them make a, a mock-up in concrete. <laughs> so they can show us that they knew how to, to deliver the quality that we needed for our abstract architecture. This is the insulation, these are the details. For example, if you have a conceptual script, you have to stay faithful to the concept. If you don't stay faithful to the concept, the architecture is going to underperform. And when you say it's abstract and we, what, we have one single material for the cast, it's only insulated concrete, you don't have any metal pieces that you need in the attic as to take the water away. You know, you put some put of metal because the concrete is not taking water very easily. So you put something and fold it on top of it. There's thousands of regulations and the Germans tell you exactly what you have to do with these things. And uh, we said abstract is abstract, there's no metal, nothing. We have to stay abstract. And they say, well, if you show us that it can be done, then we maybe give you the permit. And we discovered that this insulated concrete, this is, I'm telling you just this, because if you have a concept, you have to stay faithful. And if you don't translate the concept faithfully, you're going to lost in translation. You know that quote, lost in translation? So if you're not faithful and you start to put things that are not abstract enough, the conceptual approach is going to underperform or collapse completely. So we have a definition in the office. Beauty is the consistence of the translation between concept and something built. That is what you have to put your work. So you know how you do an attica in concrete, in normal concrete? If you don't want to put a piece of metal on the attica, you just put two pieces of, of wood 
here and here and then if you want it with a with a angle you just take another very sharp thing in plastic and you just do like this all the way and then you have very very sharp attica that should be good enough for the water to come out but this stupid insulated uh, insulation concrete has a lot of small balls of volcanic sand that that's what makes the insulation and we when we we just <laughs> roll it the, the, the small particles were rolling along it and of course that would be the perfect uh, entrance for water so a guy in the construction found out okay let's put the, pour the insulated concrete in a kind of seep i don't know when you you know you know you try to get like you put your tea in this kind of thing so we put it in that kind of thing and we take all the small spheres away then we pour it on top of the attic and when we when we see it i don't know we you follow the profile that is what it came and we show it to the german contractor and say well this, this is okay we can live with this so we made it in a very abstract way and this is happening all over the place this is uh, the moment between the insulating concrete and the existing basement and this is what we did with the concrete so we have some plaster wrapping the concrete the first uh, sediment of plaster and the second one otherwise you get another piece of metal there because the water is coming in between so we spend a lot of time avoiding metal metal is like a guerrilla war in concrete architecture so this is you know this is the constru constructions moment so you don't see anything else but the concrete no metal nothing and of course we would be replacing the plaster and then we discuss what we do with the windows believe it or not we thought in our youth that we could make a single piece of plastic <laughs> and we can pour it inside like we pour the concrete and actually you can do that but it costs only half a million or one million per cubic meter so we didn't tell the owner that we were entertaining that kind of uh, solutions but we still love the photograph so we couldn't do that we have to do a normal insulated uh, window but it was not a window because it was no frame and we were trying to make the window abstract of course if it's a transparent window it's not abstract at all so we are trying to make it translucent and we tried a thousand things many many different variations of how can we make this transparent uh, glass in a translucent glass of course it's an insulated uh, insulated uh, window this is the result so there were two really dangerous uh, design decisions the nature of the cast and the precision of the casting and the nature of the windows and the transparency of the of the of the glass and that is the final detail also the the concrete of course concrete you pour it in a rainy day you pour it in a sunny day you pour it two weeks later you pour it you pour it one hour later it's always different there's no way to go to stay it's going to stay of the same color so we need to put some level of uh, uni un uniformization to make it abstract so we tried many of them and with the artifact was easier because we did it only in wood and we we uh, envelope the wood in uh, plaster in gips um, i don't know how you say gips in, in english gypsum yeah so this was very easy and inside the this artifact where all the electricity and the air condition everything that the, the house needed was inside this light uh, sculpture and the rest was the concrete and then they asked us to <laughs> invite an artist because this is a Bauhaus and architects were always working with uh, architects and we said oh god now we are going to have to do something with an artist inside of our beautiful architecture but this German uh, artist found a way to to get inside our very 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 understated architecture he just made different shades of plaster on the walls of the artifact that you're not going to see this is a trial these are german uh, italian plasters people people who make puts or plaster 
Don't ask me how they do this. These are the same plaster with different surfaces. This is the metaphor of the artist. They are going to be different lights, but the same material. They tried, and we did it, and we are finished. These are, I don't know if you can see it here, the lines. You have to look for them, otherwise you don't find them. And that was the perfect, he, we were being almost with no noise, and he managed to fluster underneath our no noise. It was really a great piece of work, but we were happy with him. This is, you can recapitulate in your head if you remember everything what I said. <laughs> this is the replacement piece that is telling you this is new. But this is here, so you can see how it was the original, but it's not the original. We lost it because we're stupid and we tried to learn from our own failures, not to lose anything from value again. So remember that we lost it, uh, understand what we lost, but understand that we can do also something new, something that he has his own value, because I think it has some value. So we don't have to deny ourselves. And uh, we did this, these are the results. This is, of course, the piece that uh, survived the war, the basement, and this is the new piece. But of course, you are seeing the original uh, volumetry of the original house. This is the other house. This is the second half of the double house. These are the windows, they look like metal, but if you look from inside, this is how they look from outside. They really look very strange. So you see, there's nothing on top of it. So don't think that if you don't uh, you just let yourself go and say, oh, these metal things are not a big deal, they're all the deal. If you, if you compromise on this, you are losing in translation the beauty of the concept. So you have to fight all the way in your translation from the concept to the built it. And if you compromise on the way, you're going to pay a big price at the end. So we were really congratulating, congratulating ourselves of having fight to get these pieces of metal away from all the buildings. This is the inside of the windows. Of course, the, 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 the floors are missing when we don't need them. So you can see the windows in the original position floating on top of the walls. But these are the original positions. Here there were two walls, the floor, there was a bath. Now it's a balcony. And they asked for us, then we need a library. Mr. Marcus has said, well, we do libraries only in insulating concrete in this house. Because we told him about the concept and because we told him, he said, yeah, I see what I mean. Okay, let's do the library in concrete. So this is what at the end came out of it. It's very complex, you saw the artifact. Actually, as I said before, there are many places that we didn't plan and we were surprised to see. Uh, this is a very good photograph. This is the original, and this is also reality. The original atelier window was this size and we were looking for a single glass slab to do the window because we are abstract for all the reasons that I told you before. And then we ask in Germany and say, well, we don't have a place where we can put together this piece of glass is too big. We have ovens and the ovens have a size that so you can, on the length, you can do how much you want, 20 meters, but on the wide, on the width, you have a maximum width. This stupid window was wider than the bigger oven in all Germany. They have two ovens in China, forget about it. So we discuss with the, with the office if we should divide it vertically or horizontally. But if you ask me, this is really a disaster. A real disaster. No, because you have to be also faithful to your own. So this is a compromise that we did because we couldn't do better, because we couldn't go to China, we didn't have the money, we didn't have the time, we, we couldn't do it. And it happens, but I'm not going to tell you this is what we wanted. No, this is not what we wanted. So if it happens to you, it can happen to you because we are not uh, superpowers, but you have to give a fight at least. Mm -hmm. So this is the light coming through, of course, but the, the world outside 
is almost depending on the day you see a bit more of outside or not, depending on how much light is falling on, is falling in, inside. This, in the other way, if you are good with metaphors, this is the perfect metaphor of the nature of memory, and that we don't remind, we don't recall exactly how things were, and you don't notice yet because you are under 30, but I'm under 70, and I'm sure that I'm not recalling the color of my house as it used to be. So the, 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 my recalling of the past is something like how we see through this window. So we see the silhouettes, we see some things and they move, but we know that it's not exactly as they were and we will never know. So, so this is it. So if you have some questions, uh, I think you are tired and if you don't open the windows, we are going to fall asleep because the CO2 is, is very, very high. It's up to you. We can make another project, but if you are tired, I think I made my point. The point is, depending on what kind of circumstance you are, you can play the free game with a very, very open uh, situation, so an empty lot, and you will have other kind of constraints or you can play in an existing situation like this one that is a complete minefield of failures and mistakes. And you need your uh, roadmap, it's a good metaphor, you need your conceptual script because you have to move through all these possible mistakes that you may, uh, you may do. If you don't know exactly conceptually what's your goal and how to get it, you're going to miss it completely. And I would argue that all the bad architectures and architects that did Maybe they didn't start with a concept, they were copying and not stealing, or maybe they didn't translate all the way. You know, the, the lost in translation, you know the films of the mafia when the witness has been already tried to be killed and is in the hospital and has a lot of tubes. That's the concept. And there's a nurse who's late at night, doesn't look in, is not paying attention, and the mafia killer comes and make one compromise, the second compromise, the third, and the fourth and start to peep, your concept is dying. So, this is another game with, um, with your hands are tight. This is a reconstruction of a castle where you know Luther, you know Martin Luther, this guy. It's, it's, uh, here it's only interesting again, if you have many constraints, uh, that in this case was an existing building, it's not missing parts, the building is there and we have to change everything inside the building. So you're completely tight and there's no way to move around or outside the building. It's completely inside an existing building. So this is also, the irony is that if the, Mr. Gropius and his guys were telling the world that architecture is the result of the translation of the needs of the function and the form is the consequence of the needs of the function, what happens if you get already <laughs> the form and the function has changed? So this is the inversion of the, of the paradigm, paradigm also of the principle. So if you're working within an existing building, you're not following the rules of functionalism anymore because you can't, because somebody already built this thing and you have to ask the function, you have to come inside here and you have to be flexible because I can't change this, or not much. So this was the case on, I don't tell the story too much, this guy, you know this guy. He was really troublesome guy. He was right. Uh, I looked yesterday in Wien, one of the indulgences, you know, they were innocent enough that they said they could buy from the Catholic Church a document where they guarantee you if you die, you're going to get straight to the paradise and all the things that you did that you shouldn't have done are going to be um, forgiven by the church if you pay them. <laughs> so Luther was not very convinced from this kind of connection that the Catholic Church has with the divinity. So he was arguing, this is, this is guys, this is impossible, this is not what Christ says, and he made a lot of theses, not only about that, but many other things, and he put it on the door of this, the church of this castle. And the guy who was the owner of the castle was uh, Friedrich, Frederick the Wise. We are going to see that he wasn't that wise as they call him. 
he was not wise because you should know, Frederick, that you don't put the castle along the walls of the city. You put the castle inside the walls around the city. So when they attack the city, they attack the walls, and if you're lucky, your castle is fine. He didn't. He put his castle here. I can make a, a sound film without sound. That's the castle, as it used to be, recorded by some guy who was walking around in the 16th century. This is the castle of Friedrich the Wise. Not so wise. That's what happens when they attack the city and in the middle of the attack. This is your castle, Friedrich. <laughs> it's not here where it should be, it's here. So terrible things happen to the castle. What we were doing, of course, we were learning the history of the castle because if you have to work with a castle, you have to learn uh, the history of the building. And I'm going to do it fast. This is what happened afterwards. If you want to know, these are the, these are the Prussians. You know the Prussians. They are very tough people. They attack this city, Wittenberg, in the Seven Year uh, War. The Seven Years War was between the Prussians and these guys not far away from here, the Habsburgs, so between Wien and Berlin, and they were fighting for Germany. And the Prussians said, these Habsburgs, they want this city, we're going to take the city before. So they attacked the city with no reason, just in case the other ones want to take the city. Then the, it was the first attack of the Wittenberg. The castle went in flames completely. Friedrich the Wise died before, didn't never learn anything in his life. And uh, this is the Prussians defending the castle from the liberation troops of the, against the Bonaparte on the 1814. So before they were attacking the castle, a hundred years later they were defending the castle. So, so much iron. This is the castle as it used to be. These are the three floors, only three floors. This is the main rooms, beautiful castle, Renaissance, 16th century. This is what happened along the history of the castle. The castle became a fortress, of course, as it should have been from the beginning. And then it became a barracks for the troops. So they added floors and one floor in between for the barracks. And they added this kind of walls to make this kind of roof. So this kind of bombs, this kind of bombs, they were very smart bombs. They were uh, big balls in, uh, in goose eisen, in cast iron, cast iron, filled with uh, oil, petrol. No, I don't know how they did it, maybe like this. Flames, and they, they shoot it, and it went through the roof that was, of course, made in wood through the roof and through the first floor, the second floor, the third floor, all the way through the building and put the building in flames. So they said, this is not going to happen. These were not the descendants of Friedrich the Wise. They were really smart people. They say, well, this is not a castle. This is a fortress, and we are, not going, to, we are going to learn from our mistakes. So they put um, a huge level of earth on top of brick vaults, so this incendiary uh, cannon balls wouldn't put the castle or the fortress in flames again. And this is what we found. So from this to this to this. This is, uh, of course, this is the 19th century. They reconstruct something. That's what the other theory on those days, not the way it was, but the way it should have been. This is, we are over that. This is what we found, and um, if you read the castle, and this is what we found on those days, that was uh, 2000, I don't know, I think 11 or something like that. Okay, this is Sullivan telling us that the function, the, follow, the form should follow the function. This is a great quote. This is uh, what Vitruvius told us, uh, what's the essence of architecture, you know, you should know. Don't leave this place without inform yourself, and um, this is Da Vinci, this is, uh, okay, this is in Italian. Da Vinci said that as exactly as you read infinite forms in the clouds, 
you could have infinite architectures in an existing piece of architecture if you know how to interpret them. So he was telling us, you are free if you are working with an existing building because you could interpret the building in a thousand different ways. Actually, you are not in jail, you are not with less freedom. You have all the freedom you want if you work hard enough. So I'm going to show you because it's really true. This is the transcription in German. It doesn't sound like this one. Non resterò di mettere fra questi precetti una nuova invenzione di speculazione. And in German sounds, ich werde es nicht unterlassen eine neue Erfindung der Spekulation. This is so this is the, the other way around. These are the functions finding their place in the existing architecture, the other way around. So where can we put this function? Where can we put this function? The form is already there. So we were discussing with the uh, users and the owners, telling them what we could, what, which function could go in which place of the castle. So exactly the contrary of what was being told to me in my faculty, you have to analyze the program, and if you analyze the program, you're going to find your formal solution. You just follow the program. Here's the other way around. So we start to put the things. Yeah, I don't know if I'm finished. No, I didn't. It, we were convincing the, the users that we have to do this way, the way we have to do it. And we use, again, the conceptual script that was the concept behind the way to operate and to understand this building has a lot to do with the master houses. That is, you don't know if you've heard a beautiful word that is palimpsest. Have you heard of it? I'm not asking you, Hendrik. This is a, you don't know. Well, well in the Middle Ages, uh, all these uh, monasteries uh, were trying to preserve the culture of the Romans and the Greeks. They have a lot of uh, palimpsests that were made, books made of pergamon. Pergamon was the, the soft skin of young pigs. They make it soft and they were written on it. They have many beautiful things from the Roman tragedies and uh, Greek comedies and all kinds of things written in these books in this very, very uh, resistant material. But after 100 years or 200 years, these monks in the monastery, they needed the material to write other things. They forgot about the value of a Greek comedy, so they just scrap the pergamon and write on top of it the instruction of the using of the toilets in the monastery. And that happened 200 years afterwards. Then 100 years afterwards, I want to say, well, I know how exactly what toilets are working, and we have a laser system. So they scratched the pergamon again, and they wrote something else on top of it. But all the ink, because of the nature of the pergamon, goes through the pergamon all the way. So even if you scratch it, it's not going to disappear completely. So at the end, what you have in a palimpsest is that you have many texts written on top of each other on the same piece of, piece of pergamon. So we told the, the owner, because the concept is like a virus that you put in a computer system of the owner. So if you give him the right concept, he's going to start to see the things the way you see them. It's really a conceptual virus. So it gets in the other system and convinces the people to understand you. Understand means that they see the things as you see them. So we tell him, this building is a palimpsest. It's been written and written over. It was a castle at the beginning. It became a fortress. Afterwards, it became a barrack. Afterwards, and when we found it, it was a museum of the city for Australian, uh, Australian productions. So, so that's Australia culture. There was boomerangs and kangaroos inside this building. So Friedrich the Wise, I don't know, he was moving on the grave. So, so this, this building, if you look at it, and you can do it with, uh, um, with palimpsest, with uh, x-rays, you can see the different texts overlapping each other. So if you take good care of the building, you can see the castle, you can see the fortress, you can see the barrack, the pieces and the rest of these different functions that were taking, making use of the building. So we said to them, we are going to find out how many sediments there are, how much is left from the castle, how much from the fortress, how much from, 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 and we are putting our own sediment inside or on top of it. And uh, they should understand this project as a palimpsest, as an overlapping of different architectural sediments. 
and they're working all together. But before, before recognize, you have to make all your research to understand which are the original walls of the castle, which are the original floors of the fortress, what happened with the... So you have to make a long research to understand, so that would be the X-rays of the palimpsest. So we did that, took a while. This is the palimpsest. You see different things overlapping each other? This is how we understood uh, the castle in Wittenberg. And it helps a lot because once you understood, you know how to, you have your conceptual script and then you have to pay attention not to lose it on translation. So, and this is, then we discovered that, of course we have to change things, but there were different kind of operations uh, depending on how aggressive we were against the existing form to fulfill the needs of the new function because it's the other way around. So we need some, we have some moments where we were changing anything. The existing uh, staircases were kept as they used to be because they survived many things. So this is the original staircases of uh, Friedrich the not so wise. And this is the structure of the castle, but the fortress too, this, this uh, in between the floors are already not the original from the castle, but from the fortress and barracks. This is, you know, this guy, this is an Italian guy, Carlos Carpa. This is in itself the way to understand what we did in, in Wittenberg. This is the palimpsest. This is the old staircase of the Querini Stampaglia in Venice. This is the old staircase that was so damaged that he said, we need a new staircase. And they were expecting that he were going to make a new staircase. And he said, no, no, no. We just put a new, a new, a new uh, set of stones on top of the old uh, staircase. Do you see some resemblance with uh, master houses in this gesture? It's not the same gesture. So you're telling the people this, listen, there was a staircase here, but it's so damaged that we will have to do a new one, but you will see the old one and you will see the new one. So you don't lose the past, you just keep it and you add a new sediment on the palimpsest. I mean, being clear that this is the same thing. You're getting at the same time a signal of the past and of the present, and they're overlapping each other. Actually, the two metaphors are connecting right now. So this one, so this is, almost not touching anything. One kind of operation that is uh, the soft one. The second one is this one. This is where we're touching things, we're overlapping things, but we are not taking things away. And the third operation is uh, this one. You know this guy, Mata Clark? He's, uh, he's an artist who got permission to make a lot of operations in buildings that were going to be demolished. So he talk with the firm and say, listen, you're going to demolish this building on Saturday. Can I spend a day on Friday? You are, be careful. So he came and he do a lot of holes. And so he was, remember sculpting um, Gropius house? He was taking away things and making a sculpture of a building. Of course, he couldn't take the sculpture, so he made photographs and then they demolished the building. Check for him, he's a great guy and you can steal from him everything you want because he's not an architect. So. So this was the third time of operation really, really scratching the pergamon. So trying to get through and make new place for a new function. So I'm just finishing five minutes. I'm not going to tell all the details. There are many things. We can skip this one. You can see maybe the conversions right now. This is the, these are the walls that were done when they converted in a fortress. These are the walls that are taking the walls that taking the earth against the, bolt, uh, against the balls in cast iron. So, and this is the enfilade, so the corridor of the barracks and the fortress. And we want to go from this corridor to the church and connect the church that is beside the building. Uh, there's too many things. Uh, let's see if I can tell you about the pergament and the so this is the entrance, the, two, the new two entrances to the, to the visiting center of the castle. This is one new and this is the other new. These are the existing uh, windows of the fortress. 
So here, instead of scratching and doing an entrance instead of the window, we put two new entrance in between the lines. So you can write in between the lines of the pergamon so you can read what was before and what came afterwards is exactly what the Italian guy did with the staircase. So if you remember these two, and we go to the facade of the inner court, these are the two new entrances and these are the original windows of the fortress and the barracks. So if you are smart enough, you're going to say, well, this looks familiar to me, but these things are very strange. They are not from the same time they came afterwards, if you look enough. So this is, everything you see here is as we found it. This is only the only two new gestures that we did to get inside the building. And something they're going to see on the top. So of course we are doing the new gestures in the language of the old ones, but this is a new entrance. And this is the finished state of the enfilade. There are many things that you could say about it. So we are speaking the same language of the building. The building was made in plaster and brick and stone and wood, nothing else. And we are doing all the new things with the same language as the old things. So if we can do the same, at least we, you can speak the same language. And it's a way of relate to the existing thing. So we were making a polish uh, cement floor and this is original plaster in calc. I don't know how you say calc. Uh, it's the original technology and there's only these materials and the wood, the wood is uh, oak, and going faster, this is the, so you see the three materials, this is uh, plaster, stone, because it's polished stone, and this is oak, and nothing else, and we kept that language all the way. This is the library on the third floor, under the vaults, again the same materials, nothing, we touch nothing, we didn't open a single wall, single door, everything is inside, this is the soft approach. That were beautiful spaces. They didn't weren't pay attention to many details on those days. And they, we found them so refreshing. Look, look at this. The vault came after, after the windows, of course. And they say, who, who cares? Sometimes if you don't care, you really get to do beautiful things, getting rid of your own uh, limitations. So. So these kind of situations also, this and this. They're not symmetrical, they didn't care about that. So we didn't touch that because it was amazing already, the way they didn't care. What we convinced, and then this is again, to be able to read the underlying texts. The underlying text is the original vault spaces uh, from the fortress, these spaces. And the library from, this is the library needed a lot of shelves for the books. So many shelves, not one, not two, no three, four, five, at least six. They have so many books. I found out that the library of Friedrich the Wise was a famous library on the 16th century in the north of Germany. He has 50 books. That was a library of Friedrich the Wise. Now it's a library of 50,000, I don't know how many. So they said, this is the books we need and these are the shelves that you will have to build. And we said, we want to see the rooms. We want to read the text, be able to read the text. So we propose you to make a lot of space in very compact shelves, automatic shelves in one single room. So you can put all these books in one place so we can stay with only three shelves inside the vaulted uh, reading rooms of the library. That translated to the metaphor is we're trying to be able to read the original text, even if we are writing on top of it. So this is the original text and this is our writing in between. So you can see both. Otherwise, we would have shelves going over your head and you wouldn't be able to see both sides of the rooms and not the, the entire space would be lost. So you, to work in the clarity of your palimpsest, you have to convince the user with a virus, a conceptual virus, and then he's going to understand that you want to keep the text clear, and maybe he will agree to that. And they did agree to that. So, I'm just finished. I'm going to show you the most dangerous place that was where we really 
attack the building and what beauty can come when you are completely constrained. Oh, this, is, this is the model of the original without the earth. This is the way they did it. It was full of earth and the bombs were coming and just bouncing on top of it without putting the castle on flames. This is how the construction site photographs. These are the vaults. You can see the vaults. Well, you can't see them, but they are underneath. And this is another story, another metaphor about the cluster that we put on top of the building. This is what we did on, on top instead of the, the, the earth that was filling the roof. We put, uh, pay attention if you want to convince a user, you need the right moment and you have only one chance to convince them. So you only one have, you have one chance to make a first impression and uh, we told the user who was having his school of uh, priests on top of the building, we said, you know the monasteries, right? Of course they do. So what's a monastery? Monastery were the first schools of the, of, of the Middle Ages. They have uh, rooms around a Kreuzgang that would be an open gallery and the galleries around the garden. The garden use usually was a cemetery or a garden where they were having their, their vegetables too. Not necessarily. So this is a cluster, a monastery, a perfect, typical, archetypical place of education. So we told the, the user, and he was looking at me, and he said, well, you know what we do? We just, this is the rooms around, this is the gallery, and this is the garden. So we just cut, stretch it, fold it, and put it on top of the castle. So if you're going up, instead of landing on the roof, you're going to land in a kind of monastery reloaded. So I didn't say reloaded because she was an old lady, she wouldn't understand. Uh, so true, if you walk along the gallery, you have a room and a garden, a room and a garden, a room and a garden, a room and a garden. So if you look at the sketches, this is what we told the user and this is our conceptual virus and he said this is a nice thing and we want a competition because of this. And this is the rooms at the end. This is Scarpa, but we don't have time for that. So you, you can see dialogue between the old text and the new text. This is the new sediment and this is the old sediment. This is the monastery, this is the gallery. And these are the gardens on your left, on your right, on your left, on your right. And these are the classrooms of the priest seminary, of the school of priests. This is the church that they, where they train to be priests. They are very good priests. And these are the things that happened, as I told you before, that you never controlled before and that you discover afterwards. So all kind of complex situations between, always between uh, new and old, this is uh, old and new again, and here is again, uh, we are new, they are old, and behind this video, again, old. So they are overlapping all the time. This is, this is a palimpsest, right? As you are seeing the text overlapping each other all the time. This is the, the view to the original staircase of the Renaissance. This is the, the window they made for the fortress, and this is us. Uh, so then came the two staircases where the Germans said, well, the circus, you are not going to play any kind of palimpsest uh, tricks with the circus. These are staircases for the fire department. They have to be regular. They have to serve every, every single floor. They have to, fire, to have a regular um, steps. This is no joke, no <laughs> conceptual scripts. We need the staircase to work perfectly. And the staircase were two, and because you need two, in case you can reach one. And we put it at the end of the of the building. This one was an easy one because we were serving different floors. The floors were different because it's a palimpsest. They were added in different times. <coughs> so the staircase was trying to, to be on step. <coughs> but it was only connecting the floors as every staircase do. Very easy staircase to do. You just have to pay attention on the, on the steps. This staircase had another problem and this is what Da Vinci was saying. If you accept the constraints uh, and you play with them, maybe you're going to make an architecture that you would have never made if you wouldn't have the constraints that you found in this kind of 
cases. So when you see the, the building and all the trouble, you're going to say, oh God, this is all these problems. I would be like to be free from all the problems that I have to solve. And now that I'm older, when I see a very complex problem, I see, well, if I can solve this problem, it's going to be amazing. And I don't know how it's going to be. It's like, you know, a, a frog and you have to kiss it. And if you kiss it really passionately, it's going to become something much nicer. So we, we kiss this frog so many times. I don't, I don't have to tell you. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you about the prince, not the frog. So this is the prince. So this turkey had the problem that was that, let's see if I can show it in the ground floors. And I'm finished after this. So take a deep breath. I'm just going, this, this is the steak. So this is the easy staircase, the easy life. Just connecting one floor on top of the next one with, a, with an eye, very simple staircase. This one has to do the same, but at the same time, they had to allow us to get to the Renaissance staircase that was on the other side. So this staircase has to serve the floors, but always allowed to each floor to get to the original staircase. And it was very difficult because the original openings were in different positions. So we made so many staircases, also kissing the frog, not working, not working, <laughs> uh, because it was very complex. And then we understood that we don't have to make a staircase, we, we have to make bridges between us and the existing openings of the Renaissance staircase. First, the bridges in different positions. Who have seen the Harry Potter? Are you were already there? So one bridge, the other bridge, and the other bridge going from the same point, the new, to the different points, because the palim says there are different positions. So we have also the same starting position here. Yeah, OK, this is the second one. This is the, an, old, an old drawing. And then we were looking for the existing one. So we did first the bridges. And then we tried to find a staircase that went not from one floor to the second one, but from one bridge to the other one. And sometimes we managed to go to the right, and sometimes we had to go to the left. And every time it was different, because the floors were different, and the entrances were different. So that is what happened. So I'm going fast forward again. So this is, this is a bridge. It's a bridge. It's going from here to here. This is the other bridge. This is the other bridge. And this is the other bridge. And this is the staircase going to, yeah? You understood. So this is an axonometry. Um, we make models, of course, of this, because you have to be careful. <laughs> um, we tried these kind of things, but we didn't get a prince. It was still a frog. Uh, and this is the one who gave us the prince. And this is the ground floors, and this is the normal scale, the, the easy life staircase, very easy. This is the other one. This is, the, of course, this is the bridge going from the sediment to the old staircase. This is the bridge, and this is the staircase going. This is the other bridge going this way. and. This light coming from the top, of course, as you do. And uh, there's other things that we did. Of course, we did it in stone because concrete is stone because we are talking with a building. The building only speaks in oak, stone, and plaster. And uh, we did also that we, we make the upper side of the sides of the staircase very, very thin so you can grab it. But from, if you see the staircase from the top or from underneath, it's very different. From here, I would say it's very light or lighter. And from here is the other way around. So so this is the prince. But uh, this is uh, the promise of beauty in the complexity of the problem you have to solve. So if you relax and stay relaxed, and you have a very difficult problem, and you stay on it, Behind that problem, you are going to find a solution that you would never would be able to do in a new building. You can reach these kind of situations only 
in the existing buildings, so it's a beauty hidden in the existing buildings that you will never be able to reach in the new buildings. You, need a, you, you reach another kind of beauty, another kind of complexity, but this complexity, you can dream of it because it will never happen to you again because the new building is going to be different. So if you compare the kindergarten, it's a, it's a, it's a game. And you can set the rules of the game. The master houses, and this one, the game is already more or less set, and you have to play the game, and maybe you can change some of the rules. But the things that you do and you manage in this kind of architecture is sometimes they're forever surprising you because you would never have done it otherwise. So you have to you reach in the tool books and you try to fix the problem with the instruments that you have in the box. None of them work. So you have to make your own instrument, your own tool. And with this new tool, you solve the problem. So, and you put this new tool back on the box. So this kind of architecture is enhancing your understanding of architecture, making you a better architect, because the constraints make you a better architect. Now I'm finished, yeah. <laughs> so. It was, it was too long, yeah, isn't it? Just keep it. Ah, I keep it. <laughs> oh, it's... Uh, ending with this nightmare on, on kissing the frog. I'm too old for this. Uh, I, I huh? okay. use okay. or misuse the, the situation because the, I, I, would, I, I would very much like to ask the first question. And it would be how it is uh, to communicate with the people from the board of... Uh, Mm. And, uh, this way, this way, really this way. So if you don't, I'm saying, there, there are many good architects that never got a, a work to do because they weren't eloquent, they weren't charming or whatever you want to call it. But you need to be eloquent and you need, of course, if you have a conceptual, uh, a conceptual script, you have a, an idea, if you convey the idea to the user and, it's, and you do it the right way, this is the way they are going to be, or starting to be on your side. If you go as an architect with a problem, and they have to help you to solve it. So they, you co-opt them. But it's, you, need a, you need a concept. You can't go, I want to do this. No, you have to go and say, there is a problem, and this is the way we think could be solved. It's completely different. This is not the architect coming and say, I want to, you know, I want to do my thing. They say, no. This, I'm in trouble, I need your help. And this may be the solution. Okay. It works. <laughs> it works. I'm not sure, but I trust you. Well. Okay, so now it's, the floor is yours <laughs> for some questions. We still have a little time, so uh, use the opportunity. Perhaps uh, some of uh, those who have already visited. Uh, really? Uh, I forgot we are a very influential office, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. no, unfortunately, it was not me, but the, <laughs> the students also, perhaps they have questions so, or they witnessed the, yeah. the site. No. <laughs> yes, you do, but uh, I never trusted myself to make a question also in the conferences. So. Yeah. This is very funny. Okay. You, you, <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, you can, of course. Right, so, um, my question will be uh, regarding the second project where you did your extraction. The, the, the master houses of the... Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, my question will be like how or um, what is the factor that defines uh, which... Um, that defines that that's the real, like, that's the right thing to bring the memory because he chose the shape or I can say the shell. Um, and why not, let's say, the function or the wall of the building that had... Because, for example, the form of the building, it's <clears throat> relevant to older generation, but like newer generation knows and can recall this building only for pictures. And I right. can say that only maybe architecture students have seen these pictures, but not like um, other people. Of course not. Of course not. Of course, the people who are, many people who are visiting in the building, they don't yeah. evoke anything. Uh, we are different levels. As, as, as I wouldn't understand the wine that is a mixture of a Syrah, and I don't know because I don't know nothing about wines, but an expert would just drink the wine and say, these are two different 
grapes here. So the, you, of course you are talking in many differences of complexity. You can expect from the people who didn't, didn't invest a life in architecture that they will understand all the subtleness of some approaches. You are, but the people who visit the buildings, they didn't open the buildings to the original functions because they make the buildings a kind of a monument now and they are not being used in them. They're making money then with the visitors. But do you think that if you have to design this these spaces that you were required to design, but without these two sides arguing, like if you were yeah. asked as a studio, would you do the same concept or would you come up with it? Probably, yes. The same concept? Not exactly the same, but I can, I can answer it. Like, do you think that the spaces that are now right there are, will be, are like more, bring more quality to the functions or you would design like that? No, no, no. It's, it's true that, of course, you could have made better places for the functions, mm -hmm. but you, have, you would have lost the complexity of the information if you start, try to stay inside the constraints of the existing uh, volumetry. There's no question. If somebody would say, forget about the existing bricks and do some beautiful place for exhibition halls, there you go. So we are making some competition with exhibition halls. And of course, if you just ask the function, you're coming with a different an answer if you are trying to do two or three things at the same time. But the the, the I would argue that if we do this, then we have a very much more complex result that is sending information in different frequencies. Of course, we're not the best exhibition building, how could we? But it's counterbalanced by the fact that the ones like you, because if you just go there now and then you, you, you know now what's, what's behind it, you're going to enjoy this building in a completely different way. It's like the old vase. I, I, I don't know nothing about vases, if you believe it. <laughs> But I can appreciate the shape of the vase because somebody put the pieces in between. Of course, it's not maybe the best vase that you can uh, design today. But you have an extra yeah. layer of information that is enriching our cultural uh, yeah. heritage. Right. That's, that's, that would be the, the, the answer. It's a good question. Another student there, do you have students there? <clears throat> it's also about uh, one quite important missing building about, uh, about uh, Schinko's Bauk Academy. Schinko's yeah. Bauk Academy. Oh, yeah, we're waiting for that competition. Quite important one. Yes. Uh, uh, what do you think about the idea to build it again in whatever? Do you discuss this the problem in your office? Yes. And how would you approach? Well, that's a good question. So the competition is going to come next year, I think. I hope we are going to be invited because we are a small office and this is a big building. And sometimes they think that if you can cook for 20 people and you're a great cook for six people, they are not going to invite you. But uh, because you haven't cooked for 20. Uh, the question is more or less the same. How much do we want, do we think that we should be able to recall? Recall is a metaphor. We are not getting the same building at all. It's not the same systems. The systems, they are not the bricks. There's nothing. It's really the memory of it, nothing else. And the question would be, should, should we? It's not the master houses, because in the master houses, we have the fragments of an ensemble. And if you complete it, you get something like in the vase. The, the Bau Academy is completely missing. So if you ask me, I would say there's no reason because if we start to recall the phantoms because we have a phantom pain, you know the phantom pains? Read about them, so phantom schmerzen. So the people who lost an arm or a leg, they still feel the pain and the leg is not there. That's what happened with the Bau Academy. So if we are going to rebuild all the things that we are suffering to have lost, that's not the way to the future. But it's very difficult to argue that because this, this phantom pain is very strong and say, I want to have it back. It was beautiful, we lost it, we lost it, we lost it, let's get it back. And they don't, they don't, it's always when you make a copy, you lose exactly that, you lose. If you make a copy, you devalue, you take value away from the original because every copy that you make from an original is devaluating the original. So one, one result that you don't want to have. Then, of course, if you make a copy, you forget that you lost it. When I was in, in Italy, I, was, I went to the 
l'ospedale degli Innocenti, un hospital from Brunelleschi in, in Florence. And I was as a student at the hospital from Brunelleschi. And I went there and I, start, I, uh, I was inside this lodge, a beautiful lodge, and I said, this is Brunelleschi. And I got a thrill. It wasn't Brunelleschi. I found it afterwards. Somebody rebuilt it as it should have been. So we forget that some things got lost if we make copies of them. So we don't know the, the texture of history. So if we do the academy back, then we lost the, the value of the original. We make a copy. Nobody wants to know in 50 years if it was original or not. I don't like that kind of architecture in the city. I don't like to not to know in the city what's original, what's a copy. I don't, I don't like that. And of course, we miss a, a huge chance to make architecture of these days. So three things that we would miss if we just go for it and we reconstruct it. And then, and then in Germany, but not only in Germany, oh yes, we want to reconstruct it, but please, the glasses, the thermal insulation, the mortal, everything has to be the new standard. So thank you for the copy. So this is not even a copy. It's, uh, I don't know what it is. So I, I wouldn't do it, and, but if they invited to the, I think that some, one way would be this uh, evoc evocation, also the possibility to read the phantom of the past with a building that actually is, um, this, uh, when I was on the council of this, I was trying to, to convince them of this strategy and they weren't very sophisticated people. Then I said, in my family, there's uh, the niece of my, Carmen, the niece of my brother, Carmen, and she has a laugh, that's the exact laugh of my father, his grandfather. Nobody knows that, only the people in the family. When she laughs, I see my father and my brothers and sisters too, but the ones who doesn't know my family, they just see the laugh of Carmen, that is her own. So that could be a way to do the academy, to make something that somebody can understand as a hint to what was lost, and the other ones who doesn't, they say, well, this is contemporary architecture, maybe good, maybe bad, that's another story. So that could be a way. But after, after this experience with, with um, rebuilding of the Berlin Schloss, I mean... Well, that's, that's well, a cultural... It's the same. No, that's a cultural... Say, I, I hope so. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's where we... exactly what we want to Some of... Uh, well, if younger students perhaps among <laughs> <laughs> us would like to ask something. Yes. Yes, please. So um, I would like to ask, yes, one point you were talking about, um, which will be a little bit longer because at one point you were talking a lot about the, the concept and about the infecting the client with your... We don't say that word, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and on the, on the other side, you were talking about the, the frog and the brain, and yes. working with the, with the problems. And, um, I just would like to ask you, um, and in my opinion, like, there is very, very thin line between, or I don't know, how do you see, um, when is it actually um, breaking your concept, and when is it that you have to actually work with the, with the environment. Yeah. So, well, I have another definition, but this is a very, this is a, the beauty is a self-referent conceptual consistency. <laughs> so it means that if your concept is not working, it's not that you're going to ride the car against the wall, you're going to change the concept so that you are able to find another path that's going to allow you to be consistent with your concept. So this not that the, at the beginning of the design process, okay, this is our concept and we are going to die for it. No, you, you change, you check your ways and say, oh, this is not going to work. Let's change the concept. So that's what I'm saying. Beauty is, in my opinion, is the consistency and the coherence that is self-reference between the concept and what you build. And you are the experts who are, on, are able to understand this consistency and, oh, listen, this is what he wanted to do and this is the way he did it. Strong consistency. Understand the concept and understand the translation of the concept is beautiful or it's not. But uh, the concept is not something that you, you, you make at the beginning and don't touch it anymore. You change it all the way. 
So you, you are working on both sides. So at the end, you should be able to make it work. But uh, if you want to, you know, when I was, <laughs> I was in the model uh, workshop of my friend and then he was telling me, Pepe, let's, you do the box for the model for the competition it was late at night. And he had done already the box and the cover and all the holes. And I was supposed only to, you know, put the, with the machine to zzz, 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 all the six. And then I start with the first one, the second one, and when I did the, the fourth, the, the, the cover was already curving. And I asked him, uh, it's not working. <laughs> and he said, you can make one single uh, screw to the top, to the, to the end at the beginning. You have to make many rounds. First, and then the second one, and at the end, you did it. That's what you do with your concept and your translation of the concept. So you don't fix the concept at the beginning, and then you go there. Maybe you, you can be consistent with your concept, and then your beauty is diminished. So we don't know if this is the first draft of the universe that God made. Maybe he made another elephant with a, such a long uh, trump that this was carrying all the way, and they say, oh, this is not working. So I'm going to make a new elephant. So we don't know if there were many other drafts of the elephant. We know that the elephant is working. The trump is not long enough. It's long enough and not too long, not too short. It's working. So we are the, the creators of the architecture. We can go back to the concept and say, it's not working. Let's change the approach. What's a good question, then? This is the concept of beauty. We don't know what beauty is, so that's, that's a very difficult question. I have one general, very general question, actually, um, about your work in, in, in like, your architecture studio or from your experience. When approaching a project or a task, do you usually develop a concept according to, let's say, some analysis which can be also questionable, or you go with the architectural um, inner feeling, if I may say so? Oh, well, this is another which myth of... Uh, you're talking about the intuition or something? Yes, yes. Yeah. Or like how, how much can you trust, trust it, or like how much can you actually work with both of them? Because all of your projects are very conceptual, and a lot of metaphor, and I really like it. My question is just... You don't have to say that. I, I, I sometimes struggle with like Sometimes you can see the result, but... That's a... That's a or, yeah. or vice versa. No, that's a... That's a they're making two, two good questions in this uh, in Slovakia. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a long discussion between me and my Italian partner, Donatella Fioretti, and she's the one who, who comes to something I've done or we have been doing together, but she's gone for two days and I've been doing it on my own and she came back. This is not working. Just, just she takes a look at it and it's not working. Of course, I said, how can you not? You just look at it. Let me tell you what's the problem, because there's a problem. If you don't want to recognize the problem, you're not going to understand that I'm trying to solve the problem. This is not working. Thank you very much. So uh, we, don't, we don't start with a very, um, we just find our way. We, you know, we, are, we have a lot of, so that's my theory. So we have to charge the data bank, so the your memory with all kinds of solutions of all kinds of architectures, artists. You have to have a lot of things in your head, otherwise you're not going to be able to function. And then when you have a lot of, so you go to see, you, you check your websites and internet, you buy some books, please, and then go to some places and see the architecture for yourself. Don't, don't stay on the, on, the, on the computer alone. This is very good, the computer, but don't stay there. And then get a lot of input and put it together without all that, it doesn't matter. Then in two years, in 10 years, whatever, when you are on your own, they're going to have a problem and you're not going to invent anything. You're going to just pick some things and throw it and say, oh God. And then, okay, let's, let's start to see if it works or not. And then I, I don't pretend and I don't think anybody could. That's why the functionalists were trying to legitimize a new, a new conceptual procedure. 
but uh, I, don't, I don't think that we can approach in a, in a logical way. This is not the way we can solve a problem. We use a lot of metaphors, so we try to understand the problem as a palimpsest. Okay, let's try to understand the building as a palimpsest. Oh, that would give a lot of solutions. We didn't try that concept at the beginning, we tried it in many other ways. So you try some approaches, you try just, you know, like, a, you like the toolbox, you, you, you try and it's slippering so you can, or it's working very well. So this is working, but not perfectly working, so you have to work on the tool. And uh, intuition is something that it works only when you have a long experience. If you have a long experience, then you are going to be able, as Donatella comes, or we are in a jury, so you're coming in a jury, you, you look at the model and say, so these three. And anybody could say, you haven't analyzed anything. You couldn't have an opinion. No, you have an opinion because your brain is already connecting in ways that you didn't even know about. It's connecting and processing information as we call intuition because you can follow the, the logical steps, but it's doing a lot of kind of in, uh, processing of information and giving you, like, you know, giving you a result to say, this is not good. This is what Natella said to me when she's away two days. No, but it's good because she's not part of the solutions and she comes very, very fresh and just look at it and her brain just said, this is not working. And I'm wasted two days on this and I'm losing my intuition. I'm too deep in the problem. I need, again, somebody that comes from away and say, this is not working, don't you see? You, you hate it at the beginning, of course, but uh, then, then you use it and we use our intuitions uh, to check the, the solutions. But there's not, uh, we just try things. We, we don't have an approach. We start to talk and discuss and bring some things and, and try. You try. I don't think, I don't think this, this is a myth. I don't know if you heard it. The creators, the creative people, they are trying thousand things. If you, if you would say, you would see a, 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 poor, a, a, a poet, he would have a basket full of poems that didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, didn't work, and he would, and, and uh, who wants to uh, read in a, a book would be, and uh, the, the musicians, you can imagine the musicians that they are trying, or trying, and trying, and trying, no, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, till they get something. I don't think that uh, there's a short path from the problem to the solution, just like this, this is, this is not true. You try, you try, you try till you get through. We try many times. I always tell the, the students in, in Weimar that we have these sketch rolls, <laughs> like this, 20 grams, and I said, your solution is here. <laughs> but you can get there if you don't roll the sketchbook and do your trials. But it's waiting for you there, most probably. So. Well, at least you are smiling because you're going to be finishing not much time and you're going to be out there and uh, doing your thing. If you, are, if you are successful, you're going to be very happy. And if you're not successful, you're going to be very busy. And um, it's still a very good successful, whatever that means. So the, uh, the good thing in architecture is you, you never look at the clock if you are with these things and you discover that it's too late. If you are doing something where you're not looking at the clock, you belong to the 5% of humanity who's having a good time. And there's a lot of people having a horrible time. So if you are just forgetting about time, doing the things that you actually you are playing, because you are playing and analyzing, so we are really privileged to be able to survive by playing. Uh, this is really a privilege, don't forget that. There's not many professions that my father was a doctor. I was telling him that my father was a very good doctor, but actually I think he, he met maybe 20 diseases in his whole life and he saw 5,000 patients. So he's, he met the disease every time new and he was trying to, with his intuition, oh, this is this disease. We are architects where every time the new thing is new, completely new, there's no repetition at all. Every time you have a new thing to solve, of course you can use all solutions, but you can never use the same solution. And this is keeping you busy, keeping you not worrying about other things and, and not looking at the clock. And then it's too late and you are single. <laughs> you are
No, but I, I, you wouldn't like to be paid for every hour of a boring job. This is why, I, why they are there and not someone. Yeah, because it's not boring. And then, then, uh, then if it's not boring, it has a value that nobody can pay. Otherwise, they're not paying you. They are just uh, bribing you to stay on the job. <laughs> it's not the same. Yeah. Okay. I'm too tired, I think so, because I have yeah, well. I'm not able to see any other hands like you. So, you, you, you said I'm fine. you are tired. No, well, we, are, we are architects, we, have, you know, we are very okay, well so trained. We will keep our conversation <laughs> yeah. afterwards. Uh, if there are really no other questions, so uh, we should thank you again. You're welcome. Your wonderful presentation. Now I'm doing. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Heather. And now. <laughs>